Welcome to Grace Church. We're glad that you could join us and connect with our church here. For the best online experience, go ahead and download the Grace Church app. From there, you can take notes, find the Bible, and fill out a response card. You can also find all of our past messages there in case you want to watch, rewatch, or share. Grace Church Online is made possible by faithful and generous people just like you. If you'd like to contribute to the work and ministry of Grace Church, you can do that through the app or at WorcesterGrace.org. The service will begin shortly, so stand by. Good morning, everybody. Man, it is so good to see you. Thanks for coming in and braving the wind out there and making it here to Grace. Listen, before we dive into today's uh, topic and content, I want to remind you of something that's coming up that you heard a few minutes ago on the announcements, and that's a parenting workshop that we're going to be hosting here at Grace Church. We know that uh, so many of us are connected with families, and uh, we want to know how to raise our kids if you're parents, right? And we're going to offer a six-week workshop together. I'm going to be the lead teacher. I'm going to invite some of our other staff to join me in that. And we're going to give relational principles for parenting, okay? So there's going to be some teaching. There's going to be a lot of discussion and a lot of prayer, which is really good for us to do. It doesn't matter if you have a young, young child or maybe your children are out of the home, but you still want to talk a little bit about that in a different phase of life. Or maybe you're like, hey, parenting, I'm not doing that at all anymore. I still would invite you to come and join us, okay? Why? So you can pray and encourage young parents in their journey. It's two weeks from today, March the 10th, every Sunday night at 6 p.m. There's child care providers. Provided, and it's at WorcesterGrace.org slash parenting. We need you to register, okay? Need you to register so we know how to, be pre uh, to prepare for. Please uh, go online, sign up for that. You're not going to want to miss it. It's going to be a great uh, time together. We have parenting hacks about discipline and technology and schedules and sports and all those different things. So you're going to want to make sure you're here for the parenting workshop two weeks from today. You know, I think my parents attended something like that when they sat down and they had a brainstorm and they came up with an idea that totally changed my life. I was about 10 years old and my dad came to me and he said, son, it's time for you to get some more responsibility. We have got you a job. And I said, oh great, my parents got me a job. And so I became a paper boy at the age of 10 and I was delivering 150 or so newspapers to people in my neighborhood. And it was good for me. I got a little bit of income, learned how to make and manage money. Uh, and then I realized as I made some money, hey, I want to make some more money because I want to get a car one day and I want to go to school. And so I looked around and I found the most glamorous position that I could find. I became a crew member at McDonald's, okay? And that experience changed my life. I was a crew member at McDonald's in the middle of the, ready for this? The Beanie Baby craze. And if you remember the Beanie Baby craze, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, don't Google it. It'll ruin your thoughts about humanity if you're, they're already bad, right? And so I was working there and I was at the counter one day in this woman, she had ordered a quarter pounder with cheese, and she wanted a Beanie Baby, and she got one, and she didn't like the one she got. And so she was coming back up trying to do the exchange program, and she slid her quarter pounder with cheese at me, and she goes, I wouldn't feed this to my dog. And I looked at her, I looked at it, I opened it up, and it looked pretty normal. I'm like, well, that's good. We didn't make it for your dog, right? And so she didn't like that. And my dad heard about my attitude at work, and he goes, son, I don't think you understand. So he rescued me out of McDonald's and got me a job at his factory that he worked at uh, that made crankshafts. It was the world's largest independent crankshaft manufacturer. And so I started going to work there, and some of the guys on the floor, they're like, ah, you got this job because of your dad. And I'm like, yeah, my job at this factory was to clean the sludge out of the machines and clean the oil and the grime and wipe them down and then repaint them. Every day, I'm not kidding, I came home head to toe covered in oil. My mom made a changing station in the garage. She's like, don't you dare come in my house, young man, until you fix that problem right there, right? And so I did not enjoy that job a whole lot. But eventually, I landed a job at my home church. 
because I knew I wanted to go into ministry. And my boss at the time and my mentor now, when he hired me, he had a theory that every pastor first needs to be a janitor. And so for three years, I worked as a janitor on staff at the church along with my internship. And when that was over, he rewarded me with an office. I mean, a closet, but it was an office, okay? And so he put me in this closet, and uh, it had absolutely no drywall. It was just studs and insulation. And they gave me a computer, and my computer froze all the time. But not because it was slow, because it was just really cold in that office, okay? And everything froze. And I remember seeing my breath in my office at one point. I was like, wow, I landed. I finally got an office. I'm wearing this huge jacket, you know, and everything. And as I think back on all those different jobs, I'm so thankful for all of them. Every single one of them shaped me and helped me become the person that God is making me become. I'm glad that my parents challenged me to learn what it was to work and what it means to manage your money and learn uh, how to work hard even if you don't like the job that you're doing. And so today as we uh, launch this series, we're going to talk about work. And I know that some of you, you're thinking, work, why are we talking about that at church? I mean, uh, my personal life and my professional life are totally different things. Or maybe you're sitting there going, man, the pastor? You're going to tell me, pastor, about my job? Aren't you the guy that only works an hour a week, right? You know, maybe even 30 minutes, and if you go 45, that's your own fault, right? You know? Uh, well, I don't know what it's like to do what you do. I don't know what it's like to work where you work. But I do know what God says about work. And what he says about work, it works. And so I want to launch kind of uh, with this question. How is it really going for you? at work. How's it going? Maybe you're a student and you're in middle school or high school and you're like, well, I don't really have a job yet and so I don't, this is kind of like, you know, irrelevant to me and I want to tune out. Hey, don't do that because your school is your responsibility and that's your work. Or maybe on the other side, you're retired. You're like, hey, we're, things are going real good at work. Best they've ever been going, you know, because I don't have to go anymore and I'm completely retired. Uh, don't check out either because what you do with your life every day is your work. But how are they really going to work? The job that you punch into, maybe it's at a, a manufacturing plant, or an office, or at home, or at a business, or a school. How's it really going? When I say, how's it going to work, what are you thinking of? Are you thinking of like, oh, man, good thoughts like joy and happiness? Or are you thinking drudge and oh, my goodness, and I don't know, and I'm, I'm sad, and I don't want to go there? Or, or how about this one? If I just say this, Monday. You know, what comes to your mind? Oh, ugh. I got to get up and I got to go back to that place that I don't really want to go to and do that stuff that I don't really want to do. If there was a continuum and on the one side was dream and on the other side was dread, you know, dreams like, I love what I do. I can't wait to get to work. I, I, I jump out of my car. I whistle and skip all the way into the office. And then there's dread, like, you know, I need four cups of coffee, a slap in the face, and then I might get in the car, and hopefully it ends up at the office, right? Now, on that continuum between dream and dread, where are you at at work? You know, our culture gives language to things that are important to it. We give a lot of words to things that matter. There's 73 different definitions of work in our culture. You're going to spend 100,000 hours on average at your job. You might want to do something that you enjoy. The U.S. News and World Report listed uh, last month the best jobs of 2019. They said here they are, software developer, statistician, physician's assistant, dentist, nurse practitioner, and an occupational therapist. So there you go. If you're one of those, you got the best jobs according to all their criteria that they leveled, right? But it really doesn't matter what job you have to make it a dream or whether it's a dread. It's about your attitude facing that job. And too many of us have settled for lies about work. We've settled for lies like, you know, weekdays are where dreams go to die. Or that somehow my job at this job is to work for the paycheck, to pay the bills, so we can do the things that we want to do. I don't really want to do it. I don't like to do it. I don't, I don't really want to be here. But I'm doing it because I just want to get the paycheck and get out of here. We buy a lot of lies about our work. And when we buy our lies about work, we waste our work. And I don't want us to waste our work anymore. I want us to see what it's like to use our work and to see God use our work. But to get there, 
We have to gain his perspective. And so today what I want to do is kind of build a, a, a theology of work or a belief system, a framework of work, okay? And so if you're a note taker, write these down. Here are some facts about work according to the scripture. Number one, work is good, okay? Work is good. Now that probably isn't what you uh, believe in your gut naturally because you don't like work if you don't like work. But work is good. I want you to say that out loud. I want you to say work is good. Say that. That's about what I expected. That's pathetic, okay? Now I want you to say it kind of like it's true. Work is good. Okay, work is good. That's where it starts. Go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible. God created, that's part of his work. He created the heavens and the earth and everything inside of them, right? And at the end of chapter 1 into chapter 2, we read this. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Six days, he worked really, really hard. He put a hard effort into it. And then one day he rested. That's a little different than the American dream of five days of kind of hard work and a two-day weekend and sometimes a three-day weekend if you can get an extra vacation tacked on it. That way you can do whatever you want to do and then you'll go back to work all fresh, you know, refreshed and excited, right? Yeah, doesn't happen, does it? I think it's because we start from the wrong premise. Work is good. It's very good. God worked six days and rested one. God was the first person to do work on the earth. And God is good, and everything that God does is good. Therefore, when he worked, work is good. Legitimate work reflects the activity of God. And it's good. And I know that goes against some of our initial reactions. But work is good, and God takes satisfaction in a job well done. Second thing we want to kind of frame our, our theology with is that work reveals the worker. Work says something about the person doing the work. God used his work to reveal himself to us. It's called natural or general revelation. The creation of the world and the universe says something about the creator. It reveals his characteristics. And the things that we do, our work, that says something about us. Our character, our motivation, our skill, our ability, our personality. It reveals something about us. The psalmist said it like this in Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. The creation describes the creator. Your work reveals something about who you are. The term glory means to make an accurate representation. It gives a picture for everyone to see of the God that you serve or of the worker that you are. And in God's case, that's creation, right? And the crown jewel of creation was humanity. He created Adam and Eve, and he put them in the garden. And in Genesis chapter 2, we're told that the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden. Why? To work at it. To work at it. And to take care of it. It's the first ever work order put in. God put a work order in for Adam and Eve and said, take care of this. They were put in charge of fostering growth and making sure that decline didn't happen. And they were responsible for the decision-making process of the garden to make sure that it moved forward. It's all described as work. And so work is good. And work says something about the worker. So it doesn't matter where you're at on the spectrum, whether you're a child or you're in school, all the way to being retired what we do says something about who we are. But then something enters the scene that changes work forever. In Genesis chapter 3, sin is introduced. Theologians call this the fall of mankind where, where Adam and Eve didn't listen to God's plan. Instead, they listened to the serpent who Satan was speaking you know, through. And they disobeyed God. They did what he said they shouldn't do. And sin enters the world. And that's a big deal because it didn't just affect their life. It affects your life here today. At least in many ways, but at least in one way, this way. Work is now hard. Not only is work good, not only does it reveal the worker, but now it's hard. And some of you are like, yeah, now you finally have met. I know what you're talking about. Now I finally agree with you, right? Work is hard. It doesn't go the way that we all want it to go sometimes. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, at the end, uh, the scripture says, Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. Painful toil. Labor, hard work. Because of sin, it isn't always going to go the way you want it to go. The outcome isn't always going to be the way you want it to be. The things that you think should be easy at work aren't always going to be easy at work. 
And while it's true that work is good, and it's true that it reveals the character of the worker, the outcome isn't always what we want it to be, and now work is hard. Even though it's a gift from God, even though it's to be a benefit to me, even though it's to be a benefit to others, it's still toil or hard work. One of the richest guys that ever lived was Solomon, and he invested in his work. He put a lot of effort into it, and he, he worked at a lot of different projects. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, he says this, Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done, what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. The guy had everything that you could imagine. And he realized that, man, I can achieve a lot of things, but work will never bring me ultimate satisfaction in life because of sin. And so if we sit here today and we, we look at this framework and, you know, work is good, it reveals something about our character, and it's hard, we would say, you know what, those are all true, and it's really likely that we need a little bit of an attitude adjustment about our work. I bet if you're being honest today, you would admit, I probably need to tweak my attitude about my job at some point. And if we're going to do that, we should look at someone who sets the standard, and that's Jesus. Look what he had to say about work. He said, my food, my sustenance, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Even though I'm going to do a lot of things with my life, the real purpose that I'm here is to use those things to accomplish and finish the work of my Father. If we're going to adjust our attitude, we're going to have to see the potential in the job we have to finish the work that God has. Not just the paycheck, but the potential. We're going to have to live for the weekday, not just the weekend. Life truly is not lived on the weekend. Most of our time is during a weekday. And how are we going to use that time? And we fall into a bunch of different extremes with this. We either work so much because, you know, we're workaholics and we want to try to find ultimate satisfaction in it. Or we've seen that uh, wreak havoc in people's lives and so we don't want to do that and we're just a bunch of lazy bums and we don't do anything. God says, don't fall for those extremes. He says, listen, I don't want you to worship your work. I want you to see your work as worship. Do you truly see what you do for a job as worship? Do you see it as a way to honor and glorify your Father in heaven? And so that's a, that's a really quick working theology of work. The question is, what do you do with it? What's next? How do we sink some teeth in living that out today, tomorrow, this week? Well, the Apostle Paul... He wrote a, a number of different letters that are found in the New Testament of your Bible. One of them was to a, a group of churches in the Colossae Valley. It's the book of Colossians. And in there, he gives a lot of different instructions. Some to families, some to husbands and wives and children and how to interact and relate to one another. He talks a little bit uh, to slaves and masters. And it doesn't mean that the Bible condones slavery. He's giving uh, true principles on how to work even though you can't control your circumstances. And if we lift that principle up, we're going to learn something from it here today. Uh, this is what he would say in summary. He says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. This is going to give us something to dive into, to live out a theology of work that the Bible gives us. This is going to show us how to live out and not waste our work tomorrow morning. We're going to break it down for you, okay? The first thing the Apostle Paul says is, hey, listen, you need to find purpose. You need to find purpose. And when you have a job and you have something to do, that helps you find purpose. When we work, we create and we bring order and we bring beauty to God's creation. Okay? We produce things that are important that we need and that are helpful for others. We feed, we clothe, we house, we warm, we protect, we heal, we communicate, we transport, we entertain. All of those things are a part of the, th of the jobs that we do, and that's the way the world works. We work so that other people benefit. That's how it works. But have you ever wondered if what you're doing at work is really God's will or not? I'm sure you have. You're like, man, I don't know if I'm supposed to be doing this. 
And so what we want in those moments is a little bit of clarity from God. If you would just tell me, go apply for this job, I'll do it. If you would tell me, work for this company, I'd do it. We want to know what God's will is. Let's, let's pull over the car a little bit and have a quick chat about God's will, especially as it relates to work. We want God to show us or reveal to us the mysteries of his will, like, you know, all the different locations we should work and the bosses that we should work for. And we want him to reveal the mysteries, and God's in heaven going, hey, wait a minute. I would rather than reveal the mysteries to you, you would just obey what I've already shown you. Instead of revealing the mystery, I'd rather you obey the revelation. I've already given you in the Bible everything that you need to live a life to honor me. Do it. And you will end up in the middle of my will. That gives some clarity to this question about purpose. The job you do every single day, whether it's at school or at home or in an organization or in the marketplace, online, matters and is significant in figuring out your purpose. And God working his purpose in you and working his purpose through you. The beginning of... Paul's word says, whatever you do, I like this, because I know some of you right now, you're still kind of wrestling in your mind with, I really don't understand how the pastor can give me a whole bunch of advice about my job. He doesn't really understand. And some of you are trying to figure out ways that your current situation doesn't quite fit what I'm talking about. I understand that, and that's fine, but you're not going to get an exemption. He says, whatever you do, it doesn't really matter what you do. There's a whole other set of reasons for doing something. It's not the specifics. God does not care as much about the job you have as he does about the job that you do with the job that you have. That's what he cares more about. Our purpose isn't determined by where we work and what we do. It's determined by why we work and how we do it and who we work for. It's not about being a teacher in this particular school district. It's not about being a doctor or a nurse in this particular hospital. It's not about uh, all these different positions that we can have in this particular business or that business. It's about who do we work for and how do we go about it and why am I working? Why am I doing this job? Purpose. When you don't have it, work becomes a burden. It becomes a burden. And then you start to like, fight against the fact that work is good. You get frustrated. You get overwhelmed. Then you start throwing out the phrase burnout. Because you've lacked purpose. Right? Purpose directs our lives. And so we have to have a clear purpose if we want to worship God with our work. There's a second principle that kind of guides us to live this out, and that's passion. Passion. If you ever remember, uh, if there's a job that you wanted and and you were excited about it, and you saw it posted or whatever, and so you applied for it, and, and you went through all the interview processes, and you got really excited, and, and they called you, and you thought, well, maybe, and, and sure enough, they offered you a job, and you took it, and your family, you went out, and you celebrated however you celebrate, and the first day of work comes, and you wake up two hours early because you're stoked to go. You got the coffee set. The food's ready. You get in the car. You drive in. You're like, I can't wait to start this job because this is a new chapter, and I don't have to work with the idiots I used to work work with anymore at that stupid place that doesn't know how to do anything, right? And you get there, and it's exciting, and everybody's meeting you, and you're new, and it's great, and then six months goes by, and you wake up, and you go, whoa, I don't want to go in today. It's the same kind of idiots at this place, same kind of stupid problems that I had before. I don't want to go. What happened? What happened in that time frame? You lost your passion. You allowed something to suck the passion right out of you. I call them passion suckers, right? Let me give you a few of them. Critical people. They'll suck the passion right out of you. You know, you sit down at that new job, and after a couple of months, you know, you're across from someone else, and they're like, yeah, well, you don't do it as good as she used to. Oh, thank you. What was your name again? You know, I don't even know who you are. Critical people will just absolutely empty you of any passion that you have if you let them. Or how about circumstances? Circumstances. You just can't do the job as well as you'd like to. You're struggling. They've given you these uh, expectations and you're not quite able to hit it. And so you feel like you're failing. You know you're failing. And you think your failure is final. Remember, baseball season starts this week, right? Spring training, okay? Uh, baseball players that are in the Hall of Fame, they got out more than they, you know, got on. It's true. 
doesn't mean that failure has to be final. Uh, unless you allow it to be. Unless you allow the circumstances to bury your passion, they don't have to. Or maybe it's just your choices. Maybe it's the choices you're making. They're not good ones. You're stealing from your employer. You know, the, the common okay way to do it, like Facebook, you can check that all day if you'd like. That's cool. Right? No one cares. It's just time and money. You kind of deserve it anyway, right? Or maybe it's not even decisions at work. It's, it's personal decisions in your life. You're making bad choices in your marriage. You're making bad choices, you know, with different freedoms that you have. You're making choices that you know are against God's plan for you, but you have the freedom to do it. And you would say to me, hey, listen, I can do whatever I want because my personal life and my professional life are different. No, they're not. And that will bury your passion so fast. And it will suck it right out of your life. And Paul said, hey, listen, you got to stoke the passion to work for the right thing. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. If you look at the original language of that phrase, with all of your heart, work at it with all of your heart, you could take an English word and substitute it right in there. Whatever you do, Passion! Listen, I can't stand being around people that don't have a passion for something. I don't understand that. I want to go all in with something I do. I don't want to be half-hearted and stuff. And you cannot be a follower, a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ and be half-hearted at work. It's not possible. You can't be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ to be half-hearted in your home. You can't be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ and do a half-hearted effort anything. Passion doesn't allow it. Passion says you got to go for excellence. It's one of our values here is to be excellent. We don't always hit it. We miss the mark sometimes. But we want to be excellent. Not perfect, excellent. Why? Because I believe if a follower of Jesus Christ is involved in something, it ought to be better. Why? Because we're going to work at it. With all our heart. All of our heart. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm trying to be really clear. Let me ask you this. How does the work you do describe the God you love? Not the job you have. Not the title you have. The way you do it. How does the work you do Describe the God you love. You were created by God and for God, and until you wrestle that out, your life isn't going to make much sense. But I do know this. When you have a clear sense of purpose, it will ignite a full dose of passion. And so if you've lost your passion, can I give you a few questions to kind of wrestle with? What gets you fired up? What gets you excited? Listen. Listen. I work a lot of hours sometimes, but I am super stoked every day to come into work because I know the clear purpose that I have, and I have a passion. I'm all in with this thing, and this job is really hard some days, and I'm not going to let it suck the passion out of me. No one else can ruin my life. That's up to me. No one else can ruin my job. That's up to me. I'm not going to let it happen. So what gets you fired up? Well, what's something that makes you so angry that you have to do something about it? What's something you're like, man, I can't stand. That is an injustice and it's wrong. That might tell you where your passion's at. Or what gifts do you have inside of you? You're like, man, God has given me this strength, this ability, this gift, whatever it is, and I just want to use it for his glory. Man, what is it that's inside of you? You're like, I can't keep this for myself. And that'll point you in the direction of your passion. How does the work that you do describe the God that you love? Get your clear sense of purpose. Stoke the fire of passion. And then one more reminder from Paul. You need to get the right perspective. You need to have the right perspective. And this is hard because work can weigh us down. We can, we can feel the burden of it, right? 
and we feel like, man, this stuff just kind of sticks to me, all the responsibilities and the deadlines and the things that I have to get done. And all of a sudden, when we look at work from like a, a low bar level, you know, it's down here and we're in a fog or a cloud and we, we know we're supposed to elevate this thing and we're supposed to have a different perspective, but we can't figure out how to. And so New Year's comes, we grab the rope, we're like resolution time, you know, and we fight really hard and we're like, I'm going to be better at work, right? And then February hits and it's all over. Well, I didn't last very long. Oh, it's time for my annual review. <laughs> you know, I, I'm ready to work now, man. You know, two months later, back down. What God wants you to do is he wants you to elevate this perspective and he wants you to lock it into something that anchors it so that it stays up there. And it's not going to be a paycheck. And it's not going to be all the fear of why you don't perform. It's going to be found in knowing who you work for. Is working for the Lord, not for human masters. Is working for the Lord. Now, let's think about this scenario a little bit. Let's play this out a little bit. What would it be like to have God as a boss? Okay? Some of you, you, you kind of know because your boss thinks they're God, right? And so they're like, wow, yeah, I, I kind of know, <laughs> at least in theory. But what would it be like to go into work tomorrow and your boss is absolutely perfect? Not, not your boss thinks they're perfect. Your boss is perfect. Some of you wish you had a different supervisor or a different boss, and I can sympathize with that. You know, at different times in my life, I've had that same scenario. But here's the deal. You would say, yeah, I'd love to work for God because, man, he's forgiving and stuff. Yeah, but he's the most demanding boss in the world for all of us. You know what he demands? Perfect. He demands perfect. He's the most demanding boss there could be. And he's the most loving boss that there could be. He understands where we are. He sees our weaknesses and our failures, and he loves us just the same. He says, hey, listen, you don't have to do one more thing to change my love for you. You couldn't mess up one more time to change my love for you because my love for you is absolutely unconditional. He loves you. He loves you, and it doesn't stop or start based on your performance. And when you anchor to that, it changes how you see work. It's now worship. And so it helps us develop the tension or to manage the tension between the things that you want to do and the things that you have to do. And that's really a part of all jobs, right? There's things you have to do and there's things that you want to do. And when we manage that tension really well between those things, we're healthy and we're inspired and it's good. When we don't manage the tension between the things that we want to do and the things that we have to do, guess what happens? We get burned out. I had a chance to hear a guy named Steve McClatchy speak recently at a leadership symposium. Listen to what he said. People believe there's a conflict between work and life. That's an unfortunate perspective. Because you don't have a separate professional life and personal life. You only have a life. Man, he's right. He is spot on. When you separate personal and professional life, you open the door wide for burnout. Because you don't need to get better anymore at work. You don't need to have goals. And you don't really cast a vision. And you're not really worried about where you're going. Because that's just over here. Or the same could be said of your personal life. You don't have to worry about becoming better. Because it's not going to affect your job. As soon as you separate them, you get rid of becoming better. And when you get rid of becoming better, you start to fry. You start to burn out. And when you manage this tension well, you view your work as worship. And you can't manage it well until you anchor to who God is. That you are working for the Lord in everything you do. In many ways, your job is your disguise. So who do you work for? Who are you working for today? Who are you working for tomorrow? See, as a Christ follower, our job allows us the place to show everybody else what it looks like to be redeemed and to redeem work. Through our work, we become agents, agents of renewal and restoration in people's worlds. 
to live out his principles from the scripture so that people become better. That makes our work matter, and that's how you don't waste your work. And that's what we want to do. We want to live out his principles. Now, I know that as soon as I say working for the Lord and not for human masters, you'll want to point out to me, hey, I got a job that I can't talk about my faith. It's against the law. I cannot do it. I'm not talking about this. And frankly, there are some times where I think it's a better situation that you can't talk about your faith at work because some of you aren't backing it up. You're not living out of theology at work. It's probably better if you don't talk. What I am saying is, if you will find the purpose, and you will stoke the passion, and you will anchor to something that elevates your perspective, what will happen is, you will be different. Those kind of people are different at work. People see the difference. And someone's going to ask you, what is up with you? And then you'll have the freedom and the right context to share the reason that you are the way you are. And the reason that you have hope. And the reason... That you work the way you work. It's because it's worship. It's worship. You can't make a difference without being different. And so this morning, I want you to hear the story of one person in our church who lives their life out with purpose and passion. And it's given them an amazing perspective. This guy's changed how he views work. I want you to watch Jason Geyser's story. My name is Jason Geyser, and I own DecoCrete Supply in Orville, Ohio. Anything that you can do to make uh, concrete pretty, basically, we sell it. And I mean, that was something that I, I was good at, and so I, I just kept, I kept uh, pushing that. I kept pushing, and um, when, I, when I first, when I was doing that, my, my God was work. It really was. Um, that's... The work part of it, that's all I did. I, I pushed so hard, I wasn't a good person. I was too busy trying to climb, climb the ladder to success, and I would step on anybody that was in my way. I mean, I, I, was, I did it the wrong, wrong way, and I, um, I wasn't doing it for God. I was doing it for myself and for my own you know, selfish reasons. I always went to church. You know, I always was, was there, um, but that's all the farther it went. You know, Monday through Saturday, it was all me like it was all you know just trying to reach that goal trying to reach that be successful and, and I was it caused me to almost have like a burnout like get burnt out like to where I couldn't even do anything and that's when it really switched because it, it made me um, reflect it's made me so much better and I started to really think about the things that mattered and the things that, that I valued and I had a whole different approach from that Instead of trying to climb the ladder, I started to want to try to build ladders for other people. And I started to look at my employees as assets rather than liabilities. I started to you know, try to you know, really help, want to help people grow. You make a difference in somebody else's life, that's, that's the best thing that you could be doing, I, I feel. Everybody has bad things at work that happen, and you know, you, you know, you parts of your job you don't like, um, but it's how you handle those things. That, that really make a difference. And people are watching. Everything I do now, I am asking God, you know, and I'm asking him every morning to, to lead me in the direction that he wants me to be led, you know, that he wants me to go, lead me in that direction. Um, and it's amazing when you do that, what happens. I love that line where he talks about how he used to be climbing the ladder. And now he's making ladders for other people to climb. <laughs> That's a vision for work. That's exactly what we're talking about. That happens when you have the right purpose. You're stoking the right passion. And you're looking at it. You have the right perspective to view your work as worship. That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to view it as worship. And so if you're going to view your work as worship, which one of these areas do you need to kind of sink into this week? Is it to find your purpose or is it to stoke the passion or is it to elevate the perspective? It's, it's not about where and what you do. It's about why and how and who. That's what it's about. So if one of these areas is what you need to focus on this week, I would encourage you to write those down on your response card found inside your worship program or if you're online using the Grace Church app, just use the response section. Write down purpose or passion or perspective. Why? Because we want to pray for you. 
We want to pray that God would help you have the courage and the strength necessary to take the step that you need in working as worship. Or perhaps you're here and you would say, you know what, I don't even understand what it would mean to work as the Lord is my master because I, I, don't, I don't have a relationship with God. I, I don't even know how to begin that. God wants to have a relationship with you. The God of the universe that created the heavens and the earth, he wants to know you. But there's a problem in the way and it's sin. When you've chosen to do things your way rather than his, and you're guilty, and I'm guilty, everybody listening to this message is guilty. And yet he loves you enough to offer you forgiveness, to set you free from what holds you back. And he offers it through his son, Jesus Christ, and his payment on the cross in your place. And so if you want to know more about what it means to have a relationship with God, or you want to take that step today, on the front of this card, it says, today I receive God's love and forgiveness for me through Jesus. Just check that circle. Or on the app, just say, today's my day. And we'll know what you mean. And we'll contact you and help you know what it means to take your next step. So here's how we're going to end today. Something a little different. Traditionally speaking in church, a worship service starts with a call to worship. It's kind of like the first element of the order of service, where there's a song sang or a, a prayer given or an invitation or someone reads something that kind of gets us drawn into worship. And, and that's a good thing. But today what we're going to do is we're going to do a call to worship as we leave. Because worship is our whole life response to God. And if we're going to view our work as worship, we're going to leave here ready to work, right? For the right reasons. And so we're going to give a call to worship on our way out, not on our way in. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to stand. And I'm going to read something I wrote with uh, the help of a couple friends this week. A couple authors. God has called us to work as worship. He calls us to excellence. Morally, relationally, and vocationally. He calls us to do our job with discipline. He calls us to be creative and productive and redemptive in our work. God wants you and he wants me to do our job distinctively so others can see the difference that Jesus makes and how and why we work. God calls us to do our jobs with purpose and with passion and with perspective so others can embrace hard work with the right attitude. God calls you to work every day this week as an agent of his kingdom. And so, friends, I invite you to leave this room and work. To work as worship. As working for the Lord and not for anyone else. Truly working for an audience of one. I pray that we would do that. In the name of Jesus Christ and to the glory of God the Father, amen. amen. We hope that this service was just what you needed today. Whether you've been around church your whole life or today was your very first time, we believe that God has something for you and your life. If God revealed the next step for you, would you share that with us? We would love to pray for you. You can share questions or prayer requests through our app or at info at worcestergrace.org. This online service was made possible through your generous gifts. If you'd like to contribute to the ministry of Grace Church, text Grace Church Woo to 77977 to begin. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you right back here next week.